Welcome, everyone. I am Mireya Solis, Director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. Welcome to today's webinar, Prospects for U.S.-South Korea Cooperation in the Era of U.S.-China Strategic Competition. We are delighted that this program is a collaboration with the East Asia Institute, one that we started uh, planning back in May of 2019 and has been very meaningful. All panelists have drafted papers that will guide today's discussions and will be published soon by the East Asia Institute. The topic that gathers us today is of great consequence. How will US-China strategic competition shape the region? What are the best avenues for the United States and South Korea to cooperate in meeting the China challenge, in ensuring regional stability and prosperity? What are the range of objectives, trials, and opportunities in energizing US-South Korea cooperation across different domains, such as security, trade and technology, energy and environment? We are honored to have Deputy Assistant Secretary for Korea and Japan, Mark Knapper, deliver the keynote. Mark Knapper needs no introduction, but let me just highlight a few elements of his very distinguished career. Since August of 2018, uh, Mark Knapper has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Korea and Japan. And before that, he served with distinction in the US Embassy in South Korea as Chargé d'Affaires and Deputy Chief of Mission. Deputy Assistant Secretary Knapper has twice worked in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea as the State Department representative to the spent fuel team at the Yongbyon nuclear facility and as part of the advanced team for then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's trip to Pyongyang. Mark Knapper is the recipient of a number of awards from the U.S. Department of State, including the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the nation's highest diplomatic honor. Following Deputy Assistant Secretary Snapper's remarks, we will take questions from the viewers. You can submit questions by email to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter to at brookingsfp using the hashtag USROK. We will also take questions during the panel discussion, so please feel free to uh, join this conversation and send you uh, your questions. We're very much looking forward to that. And with that, I would like to uh, give the floor to Deputy Assistant Secretary Mark Knapper. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I always get really embarrassed uh, with these kind of full and, and uh, genuine introductions. I almost wish, uh, as they say, like, if my, my father were here, he would have smiled, uh, my mother would have believed it. But I, I do really appreciate that. And thank you. Um, and it's great to be here. Um, uh, I'm actually in Seoul right now. And so it's, I guess, oddly appropriate that I should be speaking about these, these issues while I'm here. Uh, but I'm really grateful uh, to Maria and to Brookings and EAI for, for uh, inviting me to, to speak today. And so I guess I'll speak a little bit. Um, you know, the subject today is about the, the U.S.-Korea relationship and uh, how, it, how it works in the, the context or against the background of, of the China challenge. And, you know, I th I'm just thinking uh, when I first came to Korea when I first served in Seoul in uh, 1993, 27 years ago, uh, the U.S.-Korea alliance, the U.S.-Korea relationship was very much uh, about uh, the peninsula. It was very limited to the peninsula. It was very limited to uh, the, th the, 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 you know, the constant threat from the north. And it was, uh, it was a relationship that had very little to do in terms of trade, very little to do in terms of investment or you know, all these kind of other things that we take for granted today. So, so we, you know, we, we focused on, on uh, the threat from the North and, and the security ties. So let's, let's fast forward. So that was 93 and let's fast forward to now. Um, you know, the US Korea relationship now is as broad and as deep as we could ever hope uh, for an alliance relationship uh, anywhere in the world. I mean, the U.S.-Korea alliance, um, of course, we still have our security ties, but look, I mean, the, uh, 
uh, trade ties. Uh, you know, Korea is the 11th largest economy in the world. Uh, Korea is the sixth largest uh, trading partner of the United States. Korea is uh, one of the fastest growing investors in the United States and in, you know, in, in places in the South, in the Midwest, uh, places like Georgia, Alabama. If you look at uh, Hyundai Motors, for example, it's a huge investment in Alabama. Uh, SK, huge investment in, in, in Georgia. Um, Lotte, big investment in Louisiana. Samsung in, in Austin, Texas, et cetera. So my, my point is, I mean, this is a relationship that has gone from just one that's limited to, to the peninsula to one that is, is global, one that is building ties, uh, creating jobs uh, for, for you know, good jobs for the American people. And so uh, we're very proud of this and, and it, it goes beyond this. It goes beyond uh, trade and investment to science and technology and health cooperation. Uh, health cooperation, of course, when we talk about that, we talk about COVID, of course. Um, this is something that, um, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't have guessed this a few years ago uh, when, uh, for example, Ebola broke out in West Africa 2014. The United States sent doctors to West Africa and we, we asked for help. Who put their hands up? Korea. And Korea put their hands up 2014, sent doctors to Sierra Leone. Uh, 2015, we had the mayor's outbreak in, in Korea and the United States and Korea together uh, worked to, to, to deal with this outbreak. Uh, and now together in COVID-19, COVID the United States and Korea are working together again. And this is just one example of the kind of work that our two countries are doing together. We build uh, muscle memory. You know, when you play golf, you, you, you hit the golf ball. <laughs> it's like you're, you, you, every time you hit the golf club, you, you build this ability to work together. And, and this is something we in Korea do together every day. We've done it. And now that we have this, this, this COVID uh, virus, we're working together again. And it's, it's just a terrific example of the kind of work that the U.S. and Korea do together every day. And um, as, we, as we move forward, I, I think um, something that I talk about, I've talked about it here, since I've been in Korea, I mean, uh, we, our, our values, our shared values, uh, values about democracy, values about um, religious freedom, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. I mean, these are things that are precious. Things are things that uh, the US and the Republic of Korea and Japan, Taiwan, we all enjoy. And uh, frankly, uh, they're under threat. They're under threat. And to the extent that we and Korea and Japan can work together uh, to defend these values, I think it really speaks uh, to our three countries, our four countries' ability to, to really uh, defend the values that, that we have. And so when the United States talks about uh, the relationship between the U.S., Japan, the Republic of Korea, I, I think we, we really do mean it's, it's not just about uh, practical issues like, like Gisomia, for example, but it's, it's, it's real issues involving uh, the values that we share, the practical sort of uh, things that we all together have. So um, I really sincerely hope that when we uh, do uh, work together, uh, that we, we think about this. And it, I think this gets to the bigger issue of today's uh, seminar of China. And so when we talk about China, uh, the challenge of China, I think, it's all clear that you know we know that that Japan and so and South Korea have very complex and nuanced relationships with 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 China. We get it, but uh, at the same time, I think we all should be able to stand up um, and speak out uh, when we see uh, you know bad behavior from China. And I think, regardless of the fact that that uh, there are very important trading relationships and, and others, uh, we get it. Uh, we're not asking South Korea, we're not asking Japan to, to cut off or uh, contain China, but at the same time, I think the countries like South Korea that have benefited from the international community uh, speaking out on behalf of democracy, I think it's important that when it comes to uh, speaking out about Xinjiang, 
Taiwan, Hong Kong. I think we, we, we hope and expect that Korea, Japan, others will, will, will stand up and speak out on behalf of these things. And so um, I know that yeah, later on, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about uh, China and the role of China and, and the role of our alliances in dealing with China. But uh, I really do think that it's the responsibility of countries like the United States, countries like South Korea, countries like Japan, to, to accept the responsibility of speaking out on behalf of democracy, speaking out on behalf of freedom. Because if we don't, who will? And so it's our, it's our job, I think, to do this. And so we'll, we'll continue to push on this. We'll continue to press for uh, us and our fellow democracies to do this. And so uh, I'll certainly count on our friends in, in Korea, our friends in Japan to, to take up this, this important task. Thank you. Sorry, I've been in so many Zoom calls, you would imagine I got this down by now, but uh, obviously I still do not. Um, I was just saying uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for those very insightful uh, remarks. I appreciate very much uh, your comments about alliances that um, have broadened now that, you know, with a trade uh, integration investment and also uh, that are based on shared values and that it's important at this moment in time to take a stand uh, uh, on very uh, serious issues that uh, emerge and to call out China where uh, there's a need for that. Um, I would like to then take the opportunity and ask you um, a, a question or two, just to remind our viewers that if you have uh, questions, please uh, send them to me via email uh, at events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at BrookingsFP using the hashtag USROK. Um, so let me then ask you the first question and really brings uh, the China factor more front and center. Um, you know, um, as US and China are now locked in strategic competition, and a lot of these now plays out in the economic sphere, there are concerns about a potential decoupling. There are concerns about seeing a two separate digital ecosystems emerge. And this is of course a concern for um, many countries, but especially those that have um, advanced high tech sectors, advanced manufacturing, and certainly South Korea is such a country given the lead that South Korean companies play in semiconductor manufacture, for example. So my question uh, to you, Mark, is in your view, what is the best way to strike the balance between addressing those uh, cybersecurity, critical technology, technology leakage concerns, but not unwinding very robust uh, uh, links of economic interdependence have, have generated a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, prosperity. And if I may add to that, the State Department a few months ago launched the uh, Clean Network Initiative with the idea to develop ties uh, with trusted suppliers and uh, not have the participation of Chinese companies that represent a cybersecurity risk. My question uh, to you, Mark, then is, what has been the reaction in the region to this initiative, uh, especially from uh, the ROK, but other countries as well? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Maria. Um, no, those are excellent questions, excellent things to explore. Um, look, I think when we talk about, uh, as we talk about clean networks, clean path, uh, we talk about 5G. I mean, these are all things that, that our government has been working very closely with uh, governments in the region, Japan, Korea, uh, others, Taiwan, Southeast Asia. And really, I mean, the goal is to ensure that, um, that our data, that our citizens' uh, private information, that our government's national security data is, is protected, are, are protected. And so uh, I think it's um, really Im imperative for all of us to, to be able to work together to ensure that, uh, that 
whether it's individuals' privacy, whether it's government uh, secure information, are, are able to be protected. And so I don't think it's, it's asking too much um, for us to be able to work with governments in the region, whether it's Japan or Korea, uh, other places, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, really to take a hard look at our networks and the networks that are uh, you know, providing the, the back and forth for the information that, that makes our lives, uh, you know, whether it's financial information or, or other information. But um, you know, certainly, I think it's, it's, it's safe to say that uh, this is something that when we talk about 5G, when we talk about uh, the work we do uh, around the world, I mean, there's no question that there are very nuanced relationships, uh, whether it's the United States, Korea, Japan, and it's, it's, it's something that we have very, very intense and close uh, conversations with. But um, I think our ultimate goal, and I think a goal that we share with our, our friends and our allies in places like Japan and Korea is that, look, ultimately we, we want to protect the data of our citizens. We want to protect the information of our governments. And so I don't think it's too much to ask that we take a hard look at what we're doing and what our various IT companies and what our various uh, communication infrastructures are doing with uh, potential, potentially vulnerable uh, companies, or, or as we say, uh, you know, vulnerable vendors like, like, like Huawei, like CT. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, question. And that's um, an issue that we expect we're going to discuss for a greater length in the second panel of today's uh, conference. So you got us to a great start. Thank you for that. And I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you another question, because I think that you have really unique insight in, um, into US relations with both South Korea and Japan. Now we know that this has been um, a bilateral relationship that recently has deteriorated. There's been an increase in uh, friction. And um, you know, I think that ideally the goal of the United States has been to facilitate trilateral uh, cooperation. And when the US, I'm sorry, the ROK Japan relationship suffers, obviously it's harder to accomplish that. Um, in your mind, um, what can be done from the US point of view to try to improve uh, uh, US, I'm sorry, uh, Japan, South Korea relations? So I get asked this question a lot. And uh, a couple of years ago when people asked me sort of how much time I spend on Japan, how much time I spend on Korea, I would say, oh, you know, of course, 50-50, right? 50% on Japan, 50% on Korea. These days, when people ask me that question, I say, well, you know, 20% Korea, 20% Japan, and 60% Japan, Korea. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I say that meaning that um, to the United States, the Japan, Korea relationship is, is, is of critical importance. And when we say, and we do say that we don't take sides, we don't mediate, we don't get in the middle, we don't try to arbitrate. It doesn't mean we don't care. It doesn't mean we're not interested. The Japan-Korea, Japan-South Korea relationship is of critical importance to the United States because, and getting back to what I said before, these are two democracies, liberal, transparent countries that, that do the kind of work that we do in the United States, if we, our three countries, don't stand up for democracy, if we don't stand up for freedom, then who will? And so we have to figure out a way to get along. And, and so the United States, we don't presume to find a way to, to get in the middle or to mediate. Um, this is up to Japan and Korea to do. Um, same time though, it does not mean that we don't care. It does not mean that we're not interested. We are, we do care, we are interested. 
and, and very often we do things that aren't apparent uh, to the press. We do things that aren't apparent uh, to the public, uh, but nonetheless, we are working very hard with our allies, with our friends in Tokyo and Seoul to try and find a way to, to move our three countries forward because we have to. And we understand, I mean, history issues are sensitive. Um, heaven knows in the United States, you know, we, we have our own history issues and, you know, we, we, we deal with it every day. And so it's not for us to presume to speak about uh, history issues between Japan and Korea. But uh, at the same time, I think it's fair to hope that between South Korea and Japan, that they can address these issues in a way that promotes reconciliation and promotes a path to a, a brighter future, a path to a future that involves productive and constructive relations between not just Seoul and Tokyo, but Seoul, Tokyo, Washington, among all of us. Because we have to. I mean, if you look at the region, it's just you know, our countries share these values and our, our, you know, we share democracy and, and freedom of, of, of speech and religion and things that are under threat. These things are under threat. If we don't stand up for it, who will? And so we, we really have to figure things out. So that's my hope uh, going forward that we're going to figure these things out and we will uh, find a way for our three countries to uh, build a better, a better relationship. Thank you, uh, Mark, for uh, those comments. And I have one final question for you. Um, as I mentioned when I introduced you, um, you served with distinction in the U.S. Embassy in uh, South Korea at a time when there was a lot of tension in the peninsula because of the provocations of uh, the North Korean uh, regime. If I remember correctly, we used to refer to those days as the fire and fury uh, uh, days. And after that, there were a couple of meetings between uh, um, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Um, so given all that you know about the evolution of uh, US-North uh, um, Korea uh, relations, uh, can you talk about what the US and South Korea can do at this moment in time in dealing with these uh, threats coming from North Korea? Well, thanks, Priya. I mean, you were, you were, you're right. I mean, that was, uh, 2017 was a really uh, pretty <laughs> stressful time for those of us who were, who were living there. Uh, we had uh, uh, the sixth nuclear test. We had a couple of ICBM launches and for sure it, uh, it was a time of great uh, tension on the peninsula, but um, you know, I think uh, U.S. diplomacy, in particular, uh, leader-level diplomacy between you know President Trump and Kim Jong Un, helped to help to lower lower the tension and hopefully set the stage for for for, for future progress. Um, but you know, obviously, in the past you know few weeks, months, years, uh, there hasn't been much uh, and. Regardless though, I, you know, our message, our public message and in private message, frankly, is that the door to diplomacy remains open. The door to finding a way forward remains open. And, you know, we firmly believe uh, if you go back to the Singapore statement from, uh, from 2017, uh, the statement that uh, between the United States and North Korea about transforming the US North Korea relationship between uh, you know the building a peace regime on the peninsula improving north south relations uh, bringing home the remains of american soldiers i mean these these are commitments that we made with north korea uh, between our two leaders and this is a, a, a you know a, a spirit that we we still hope to 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 to, Im to implement and so and then where we are today, I mean, I can't speak about what's going to happen in a couple of months, but at this moment today, we still sincerely hope to be able to implement and actualize the spirit of the Singapore statement to the point where, you know, to, to transform our relationship, to denuclearize, to bring a better and brighter future to, to the people of North Korea. 
Thank you so much, Mark, again, uh, for joining us, for starting us to a great uh, discussion throughout the morning. I think your uh, last set of remarks actually provide the perfect segue into panel one, um, which will be moderated by my colleague, Jun Pak, the SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korea Studies. So I want to thank you again and then turn things over uh, to Jung. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks, everybody. Um, and thanks to Mark Knapper, who is one of the hardest working diplomats out there, or hardest working maybe in uh, one of the hardest working uh, folks in the State Department and, the, and in the US government. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's late at night. Um, my name is Jung Pak. I'm the Korea Chair at Brookings. I'm really pleased to be uh, moderating this first panel. Uh, with our distinguished colleagues at Brookings as well as at uh, from e uh, East Asia Institute in Korea. Um, let me introduce the our panelists very quickly. Um, let me start with our Korea team first. Um, we have Dr. Che Sung Chun, who is the chair of the National Security Research Center at the East Asia Institute and also a professor at Seoul National University. Dr. Chun serves on the policy advisory committee to the South Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Unification. He's the co-author of The Korean War, Threat and Peace, um, and Our Politics, Moral, and International Politics in East Asia, History and Theory. Uh, Dr. Uh, Young Sun Ha is the chairman of the Board of Trustees at the East Asia Institute and Professor Emeritus at Seoul National University. Dr. Ha serves as a member of a senior advisory group for the Inter-Korean Summit Talks uh, Preparation Committee and he also serves as a member of the Presidential National Security Advisory Group and on numerous research and policy organizations in Asia, the US and Europe. Dr. Suk Jung Lee is a professor of public administration at Sung Young Gwan University and a senior fellow of the East Asia Institute. She has been directing the Asia Democracy Research Network since its formation in 2015, leading a network of about 19 research organizations across Asia to promote democracy with the, with the support of the National Endowment for Democracy. She's, she recently co-authored Transforming Global Governance with Middle Power Diplomacy, South Korea's role in, in the 21st century. Let me move over to our Brookings colleagues who are joining us. Um, Lindsay uh, Ford is, the is a David Rubenstein Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Uh, Ford has served in a variety of roles within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, including as a Special Assistant to Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel for the 2014 U.S. ASEAN Defense Forum. Ford was also a leading architect of the Asia Rebalance Strategy work for the Department of Defense's 2012 Defense Strate Strategic Guidance Review and oversaw the development of the first Asia Pacific Maritime Security Strategy in 2015. And, and Lindsay Ford is always my go-to on, on all things Asia and security issues. Um, last but not least, one of my favorite people at Brookings um, on either coast, on the East and the West Coast, uh, is Jonathan Pollack, who is a non-resident fellow at Brookings. Uh, between 2012 and 2014, he served as director of the John L. Thornton China Center here at Brookings. Uh, he has authored or edited over two dozen books uh, and research monographs and has made important contributions to the study of China's international strategies, the political and security dynamics of the Korean Peninsula, East Asian international politics and US uh, foreign and defense policies in Asia and the Pacific. Um, so, you know, uh, after we hear from the panelists and we go have a moderated discussion, I'm going to turn to you, the audience, uh, for your questions. So please uh, pl send your questions to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter to the at brookingsfp uh, handle using the hashtag USROK. Uh, I'd like to ask our panelists to start up with, tee up some questions for them. Um, and I wanted to turn to doctors uh, Chun and Ha. Uh, I think Dr. Chun is going to speak first, but um, you know, South Korea sits in a very difficult geopolitical environment. On the one hand, it has a decades old alliance with the United States designed to counter a dangerous North Korea. On the other, it is dependent on China for its economic security. Can you briefly explain the ways in which US-China rivalry complicates 
South Korea's foreign policy choices. Uh, let me turn this over to Dr. Chun first. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great pleasure to participate in, uh, in this uh, panel. My topic today, uh, well, we'll talk about more South Korea's position, but first, uh, US-China rivalry, how South Korea sees it, if, especially after the uh, 2020 presidency election. So let me briefly talk about uh, this China rivalry from South Korea's perspective. So after President Trump's foreign policy, uh, which defies any familiar past grand strategic concepts and categories. Uh, now we have President-elect Biden's foreign policy, and uh, his grand strategic ideas draws much attention. Uh, as domestic concerns rather than foreign policies will be critical once Biden takes office, but uh, we can predict that very soon foreign policy issues will be very important. Uh, President-elect Biden has not made detailed mention regarding foreign policy besides general principles, especially we have great interest in U.S.-China rivalry. But we know that uh, Biden administration will focus on strengthening American power along with legitimacy and authority. Uh, his trust is multilateralism and norm diplomacy. Uh, the question then is, uh, will the U.S. continue to maintain the role of the global hegemon a liberal hegemon which provided the most fundamental collective international goods to contribute to the stability of international order. Uh, and we see that American power has in fact a little bit weakened uh, during the US unipolarity polarity because US has too much burden and our archivist alliance uh, was influenced by those changes. Uh, but uh, South Koreans believe that there is no reason the U.S. should weaken its global leadership role when the world is in great peril and hardships. Uh, it is obvious that gl uh, global complexities these days will pose greater challenge to the United States to take a role of leadership as in the past. And uh, President-elect Biden's proposal for the global democratic forum in this sense uh, probably South Korea will be part of the forum we wish is a great idea to establish a collective mechanism for setting up and managing rule for norm-based international order. Uh, so let me go to South Korea's uh, position. Uh, Biden administration may continue to adopt several policies of uh, for, uh, the current president uh, Trump's uh, policies, uh, uh, some of them, but how President Biden will conceive the ultimate end state relations with China is highly significant because, you know, South Korea will be greatly influenced by that. If competition, especially rule-based competition and cooperation does not open the room for engaging with China, meaning that the room for inducing not just behavioral changes of China, but structural transformations of China in various areas, China will respond with confrontational policy and outside pressure or overbalancing will strengthen Chinese nationalism, which in turn consolidate authoritarian resilience. But now we have a greater uh, military gap between the United States and China is still large and surmountable. And we, when we count alliances as a strong support, we still have an edge in military balance of power. So when the democratic forum works very effectively, there is likely to be a, still a chance to shape the future decisions of uh, China. So there is no doubt that South Korea's most fundamental and long-term strategic purpose coincides with the U.S. South Korea has developed under the U.S.-led li uh, liberal international order and has contributed to strengthening this order, showing formidable followership. But for short term, as we all know, you know, South Korea's economic dependence on China is great, and we have a North Korean problem that uh, needs, uh, to some extent, Chinese assistance or participation, active participation, such as uh, sanctions and establishment of peace regime. For short term, uh, from a more tactical point of view, we need a well-devised package to cope with the rise of China to sustain the Asian alliance network. Uh, so let me uh, go through very briefly, and uh, that is the end of the first round, uh, which is first, we need a very flexible security architecture 
in which no sole security network of cooperation dominates. Uh, I think hub and spoke systems so far worked fairly well, and we may combine more collective or mini lateral network at the same time. Second, we need a formidable collective response system to cope with Chinese possible retaliation, especially using economic coercive means uh, to which South Korea has been very vulnerable. So deepening economic interdependence on the U.S. by a unipolarity will be reshaped anyway, but it will take time and the optimal form of interdependence with China is yet to be determined. Third, as the degree of vulnerability to Chinese coercion and the need to cooperate with China in certain areas are different from countries to countries, for the time being, it's necessary to have a well-devised division of roles in making and implementing China policy with Asian allies. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Ha. Dr. Ha, you're muted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Following the Professor Chan's uh, remarks on the ROK-US alliance cooperation in the Asia US-China strategy competition as a kind of division of labor, I will briefly sum up uh, another major issue, uh, two administrations cooperations for the denuclearization of North Korea. For this purpose, the most urgent task is the joint development of the new way of calculation for the complete denuclearization of North Korea, as we all know, after the failure of second Hanoi summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un, North Korea has continuously complained the old way of calculation of the United States and advocated the new way of calculation for the successful summit. At the same time, North Korea strongly advocated his version of three stages of denuclearization as a new way of calculation. The first stage is the unilateral process of trust building. The second stage uh, is a step-by-step -step simultaneous action for the exchange of the partial reduction of nuclear capabilities, excluding nuclear capabilities for minimum deterrence and the gradual lift of sanctions and the beginning of the peace building on the peninsula. The final and third stage is the implementation of both complete denuclearization of North Korea, including minimum deterrence and the complete security guarantee on the basis of abolishment U.S. hostile policy toward North Korea, including U.S. forces in Korea and also nuclear strategic assets around the Korean Peninsula through nuclear arms control talks in the Asia Pacific. It shows that the North Korea is ready to negotiate partial reduction of nuclear capability as a compensation of gradual lift of sanctions. However, it is also clear that North Korea is not yet take the strategic decision to accept the complete denuclearization. Under these circumstances, ROK and the United States should make joint efforts in developing new roadmap of complete denuclearization and blueprint for North Korea's peace and prosperity in the 21st century. In the case of roadmap of complete denuclearization, bottom-up negotiations can start from the st stepping stone of nuclear freeze for the final goal of complete denuclearization. However, as 
North Korea's sincerity. Uh, complete denuclearization has not yet proven North Korea's comprehensive report of verification lists of nuclear capabilities should be deeded as a confidence building measures for the final stage of denuclearization. In the case of blueprint for North Korea's peace and prosperity for the 21st century in parallel with the process of nuclear freeze, gradual sanction lift and security guarantee for non-nuclear North Korea should begin to be implemented as confidence building measures of developing friendly relations with North Korea. For the final stage of complete denuclearization and security guarantee, it is necessary to non for non-nuclear North Korea to reorganize itself politically, economically, socially, culturally, ecologically, and technologically to adjust itself to the 21st century. In this process of self-reorganization of North Korea for the 21st century, I think the regional peace system should be built to provide maximum security guarantee for non-nuclear North Korea. At the same time, the global support of North Korea's self-reorganization reorganization program should be arranged. Uh, Moon and Biden's joint efforts to design this kind of new way of calculation will be the one of the most urgent tasks in the Asia Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ha, Thank, uh, Dr. Chun. Um, Jonathan Pollack, um, Dr. Ha started talking about North Korea, and we've talked about this many, many times over in our offices at Brookings about, about North Korea. Um, tell us about, you know, what are the implications for U.S.-China rivalry on North Korea policy? Um, and given some of the warming of ties between Beijing and Pyongyang, um, how does this all play in, in North Korea's calculus? Um, as well as, uh, and what does that mean for South Korea, you think? Jonathan, you're on mute. You. Still on mute. On mute. Can you Adam. hear me now? Yes, yep. Great, okay, good. Um, I often get the feeling um, when we have discussions about North Korea, that we're a bit like the old Bill Murray movie Groundhog Day, uh, except that unlike the movie Groundhog Day, things don't get better, they get worse. I think we need to begin uh, understanding about how we might proceed with a candid acknowledgement of where we are now, vis-a-vis -vis both North Korea and China. Um, the Trump administration made every effort uh, to, in a, on a unilateral basis, um, redefine the terms of reference uh, on dealings with North Korea, perhaps in an effort to marginalize China, uh, but that didn't work. It didn't work because of course, to the degree that um, uh, Mr. Trump, uh, at least for appearances sake, sought to change relations with North Korea, um, it gave Kim Jong-un much more latitude uh, with respect to dealings directly with China. And it is true there has been a certainly a tactical warming of relations between uh, China and North Korea. Uh, I don't know that I would claim, I mean, I don't, I don't think it entails a reaffirmation of security guarantees to North Korea. It is rather a sense of shared interest that there are animosities that both North Korea and China have towards the United States. Uh, but here again, uh, I wanna emphasize um, that let's for the moment set aside the legitimate issue of common values in our relations with um, the ROK uh, and Japan. And let's look at the question of interests as it affects what China might or might not do vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and its nuclear goals. Um, in this respect, it's my own firm belief uh, and the Biden administration, not yet in office, is clearly articulating this, that there have to be areas in which we cooperate with China uh, and I happen to feel that 
nuclear non-proliferation is very, very high on that list. We must acknowledge, however, uh, that five American presidents uh, have tried uh, to slow or prevent outright North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons capability using the full range of political, economic, uh, and diplomatic tools and strategies, none have achieved success, as we can see. And objectively speaking, I would argue that the circumstances today with North Korea going about its labors here, introducing new weapon systems, and leaving open the possibility that it will resume testing uh, as a kind of a, um, an early welcome, should we say, a negative welcome, uh, for the Biden administration needs to be considered. We know, of course, that North Korea will hold its uh, uh, the eighth uh, Congress of the Korean Workers' Party uh, sometime uh, in January. Uh, and it's possible that North Korea will unveil its thinking they, as they try to kind of acclimatize uh, the new administration as they have others to what their priorities and goals are. But my real issue here is if we are trying to find a way to deal with China, we have to recognize that China gets a vote in this process by history, by geography, by economic interest. The idea of separating China from where we might proceed vis-a-vis -vis, uh, North Korea and its possible futures, it seems to me uh, is very, very ill-advised at best. Um, so the question then becomes, is there a basis here on which um, the United States could, in fact, reopen uh, discussions with China that direct that address questions related to North Korea's nuclear weapons and the long-term future of North Korea more generally? Uh, we should not be highly optimistic about these possibilities, but I see a window, uh, a test case, if you will, of the ability and the interest of China to work with the United States or not work with the United States. It could go either way, depending on how we approach China in this area and whether or not we in fact state that there is a common American and Chinese interest in preventing the nuclear weapons development of North Korea, continued unconstrained nuclear weapons development of North Korea. My own belief would be, this is my last comment, I think a fully realized operational nuclear weapons capability by North Korea would be a strategic disaster for China and for the United States. And that should be a starting point in our discussions with China if we can arrive at candid understandings apart from all the standard formulas that are used uh, in, have been used in the past to, to, to talk about these issues. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I want to turn to Lindsay Ford now. Um, Dr. Jezong Chun talked about this um, in his opening remarks. Um, South Korea has been reluctant to endorse or participate in the Trump administration's quadrilateral security dialogue. One senior advisor to the Moon administration said Seoul's participation in a NATO-like structure would create an existential dilemma for South Korea and that China will, quote, treat us like an enemy. You argue that though in your paper that there is a way to enhance South Korea's role in regional defense networks. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, thanks, Jung. Um, you know, in my paper, first I wanna say um, the Quad is not going to become an Asian NATO. So I think right off the bat, we need to all just put aside that that is even a realistic prospect. But what I really say is that Korea and also US policymakers need to focus a lot less on whether or not South Korea participates in the Quad formally and needs to think more about the underlying defense relationships that South Korea has with Quad countries. Because when you think about what facilitated the sort of revival and the momentum that we've seen in the quadrilateral security dialogue over the past couple of years, it's actually that the bilateral and then trilateral relationships between participating countries especially like Japan and Australia or Australia and India grew a lot stronger in the years between 2007 when, when the Quad sort of first kicked off and then its revival more recently. And so what it really is, it's been a step-by-step -step process. And I think there are similar opportunities for South Korea to, in a step-by-step -step way, enhance its own defense networks in the region. Beyond opportunity, I actually think there is a need to do this. 
um, this isn't about China and it actually shouldn't be about China at all. And I, I realize that's perhaps a strange argument to be making in a panel discussion that's supposed to be about US-China competition. But I think actually we can't allow that focus on competition or even China to have a veto over how other countries think about cooperating with their neighbors in Asia. South Korea has its own interests in being able to shape the region around it. And more importantly, it has a lot of capacity as a strong middle power with a large economy um, and one of the region's most capable militaries that it can bring to bear in working with neighbors to make Asia more prosperous and secure. There've been obviously some hurdles in recent years, not just China, but the rockiness of the relationship between Japan and South Korea. But when you look at the relationships between South Korea and two other quad countries, Australia and India, they have really been steadily growing their defense ties for the last decade. And there's a lot of common ground there that you can begin to build on. For example, South Korea and India just signed a defense logistics agreement in 2019 that makes it more possible for them to do um, naval cooperation with each other, refueling. Um, and notably, India is the only country other than the United States that South Korea has that kind of arrangement with. Similarly, Australia was the first country other than the United States that South Korea established a high level two plus two, meaning foreign policy and defense dialogue with. So that, that basis and that foundation is there. What I think is that countries need to think about how they sort of build on that and move forward. And there are a few areas that they could explore. Maritime security, I think is an obvious one. South Korea has a lot of economic interest in the Middle East, and that's been driving some of its cooperation with India in particular. You can look at things that India is doing, like creating a, an information fusion center to try to bring more maritime domain awareness and safe and secure shipping in the Indian Ocean. And I think there are places where South Korea, Australia, and India could all work together more in that space. Um, space is actually another one where um, North Korea has growing space and anti-space capabilities that I think are a concern for South Korea and will be more in the future. It's already conducting civilian cooperation with both India and Australia on space, but there's a need to take that into the um, defense realm as well, to have dialogues about space security, roles of the road in space, what kinds of cooperation you could create um, to make the civilian capabilities that all of these countries are building more secure. And then finally, an obvious one here would be defense industry cooperation, where um, there have been growing conversations between South Korea and India and Australia um, about R&D cooperation. South Korea has a growing defense industry that is selling abroad, including to India and Australia. But you have to think about this as more than just dollars and cents. It can't just be transactional. What this does is it actually creates opportunities as well to think about interoperability between these militaries. So where are there exercises that these countries could do together building on the capabilities that they are increasingly going to have in common? Australia, for example, has a large annual exercise talisman saber. Uh, both India and South Korea already participate as observers. These are the kinds of things looking forward where you could begin to actually participate in a more routine and regular way. None of this means South Korea has to participate in the Quad. What it does mean though, is I think it puts you on a trajectory in the long term to have the kinds of flexible defense networks that you heard Dr. Chun talking about earlier. Thanks, Lindsay, for those, uh, those excellent um, and really meshed well with uh, what Dr. Chaesung uh, Chun uh, led us off with. Um, I wanted to turn to Dr. Suk Jung Lee. Um, the East Asia Institute has some fascinating data on South Korean public opinion regarding the US-China rivalry uh, and the US-South uh, Korea alliance um, and breaking them down by demographic. Can you talk to us about two or three key takeaways uh, from that survey and the implications for President Moon's policies in the remaining 18 months or so of his term? Okay, it's good to see you, Dr. Uh, Jung Park online. It's uh, midnight in Seoul, so you know I, I, I allow me if I don't sound coherent enough. Okay, uh, as you have mentioned, the East Asia Institute uh, has carried out many uh, public opinion surveys, and the one survey I'm going to use is uh, our national identity survey. Uh, so using from 2005 to, to, uh, to, to uh, 2020 this year. 
So I'm uh, glad to report that uh, since the mid to, uh, 2000s, uh, South Korean's uh, support for the alliance has been uh, solidified. We usually ask uh, the autonomy and neutral and the support for the alliance. And over the last uh, 15 years, there is a 17.6% gains in the, uh, the band of uh, the alliance support. So that's the sign. Okay, then who would be the supporter? And I checked the demographic uh, background. And, and of course, the South Koreans who are aged the 16 and over a most ardent supporter of the alliance with the USA, uh, uh, but it don't discount this aged group, including myself, because this population counts accounts about a quarter of a total population of South Korea. And uh, we usually discuss whether there is ideological, like a progressive or conservative, or the ruling party and the opposition party, the kind of uh, the the ideological and partisan identity, actually uh, those factors uh, don't influence South Korean's attitude toward the lands that much, not at all. And also the repetitive findings uh, throughout the survey is that the more educated and also the more strong uh, believers in democracy tend to be more critical about the the alliance with the USA, I guess obviously the more educated and then the democracy believers uh, tend to believe the, the, the equal partnership and they are very, have a strong national pride. So that kind of things are related negatively with the, the, the support of the alliance. And next question is why many Koreans support the alliance relationship with the USA. The most important factor I found through statistical analysis is that the, the very high favorability of the U United States. Usually we use a typical 100 degrees uh, thermometer and South, uh, the, the America scored 67.5 degree in 2015 survey and this year, 62 degree. Actually, that's much higher when we compare to other countries. For example, China, uh, this warm feelings towards China had a decreased uh, over the last five years. Maybe this is related to, to the sad issues of economic retaliation, retaliation from uh, China government. And very interestingly, the most, um, young generation who are aged 18 to 29, they feel very warmly about United States. So this is even higher than the old group uh, who are more than aged 60. So this is a sign, this young generation will sustain uh, the alliance because they like the USA, <laughs> okay? And also among the threat perception, uh, naturally, uh, South Koreans who feel threatened because of North Korea, then they tend to support uh, the alliance with the USA more. I was curious, so I checked the China threat, and of course, more Koreans these days feel threatened by China. However, when we uh, measure the, with other factors together, the China threat perception, even though South Koreans feel great, doesn't affect them much in the support of the alliance. And also I checked the threat perception of uh, China-US rivalry because many Koreans are uh, worried because we are pushed to choose either of them. But actually the majority, more than 64%, want to uh, South Korea take a neutral position in these competitions. However, if they are pushed to choose either of them, twice more Koreans I think uh, we have to be close to US side rather than China side. So I checked with uh, their uh, relationships and many Koreans feel uh, uh, feared of entanglement. Uh, so if the conflict is high between USA and China, uh, they think uh, it, it may be dangerous if we are too much loyal to the alliance. So 
this threat perception driving from the rivalry between two great powers uh, affect negatively to the strong support to the alliance. I think that is uh, related to uh, not only um, Moon Jae-in government and also the, the president-elect Biden's next government. So let's say if they push too much about this court from the military perspective, I think many Koreans will say, no, it's too much. But however, if you, as uh, uh, Lindsay has mentioned, there are many other ways to engage South Korea in, uh, in the Pacific strategy of the USA. Uh, and overall, the alliance um, support from South Korea is very high. So it's good for the Kachigashita for both presidents. So let me stop here. So because I just, you know, I have only five minutes. Uh, no, thank you. That, that's great. Um, and I know it's midnight and, and, uh, uh, and you know, this is a very late time for you. So thanks to um, our panelists from Seoul and for our viewers in Asia watching this. Um, it's morning in DC. So my kind of uh, muddling through is it, I have no excuse um, at, at all. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of some recent polls. Um, there was a Pew Research Center poll, poll that said that 83% of Koreans had no confidence um, in Xi Jinping to do the right thing on world affairs. Um, and a Chicago Council poll um, said that only 14% of Koreans saw China as a reliable partner. Um, and I think some of those, um, so some of the, the, the negative uh, responses on China's role and China's um, uh, activities um, really uh, is, is uh, incongruent with some of the soft power things that China has been trying to do. Um, and the fact that the tourism from China is, you know, South Korea's biggest, you know, source of, of tourism. Um, and that more Koreans and Chinese um, engage in student um, exchanges than, than with any other country. So I, so I think that's, uh, that's really interesting that that kind of negative reaction um, is, uh, it exists alongside that very, you know, the, these person to person um, exchanges. Um, you know, I, I, before we go into a moderated discussion, I have some follow up questions for our panelists. Um, I wanted to remind our audience um, that if you have questions, uh, I know some of you have already uh, submitted some, um, is uh, please uh, send an email to events at brookings.edu or on Twitter at, at the handle at brookingsfp, hashtag USROK. Um, you know, underlying this discussion today um, is a fundamental question about the future of the US-South Korea alliance, how to modernize it more flexible, as Dr. Chun mentioned, uh, and more broadly, what the regional security architecture should look like. Um, given the different national priorities and threat perceptions uh, of China and, and the China challenge, how do we move forward with closer defense cooperation? Lindsay Ford um, outlined some of, the, the, some of these steps earlier. Uh, what are some near-term actionable measures that Washington and Seoul can take individually and together? And let me turn to... Um, Dr. Chun and Dr. Ha, um, if you if you can take this on, is uh, you know Dr. Chun, you mentioned the uh, the idea of a U.S. ROC um, strategic dialogue or and and other flexible ways of dealing with this, not this monolithic um, NATO-like structure. Um, what kind of input can Seoul provide? Um, Lindsay Ford mentioned a whole series of things on maritime security, space security. Um, and that South Korea is already doing some of these networking with, with um, quad countries. Um, so can you, uh, uh, Drs. Chun or Ha, um, elaborate on what Seoul can provide in those dialogues um, and what types of initiatives Seoul uh, would be willing to take? Well, first thing I, uh, I'm thinking of is the advent of the liberal international order in 1940s when the United States suggested that order, which was very good, it was a package deal. It was composed of the hub and spoke alliance and massive economic assistance and uh, with a very good ideational lead for human uh, rights and market economy. And right now we need that kind of package. You know, when South Koreans are fearful of uh, Chinese influence in some sense, uh, basically retaliation, 
when we strengthen our alliance for the regional security architecture, which is good, but we have experienced already uh, Chinese retaliation, even though we have a FTA with China after the third incident, uh, plus, you know, the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, when we think of the package, US and uh, South Korea should think of how to collectively respond or minimize any possible harm that can come from a, a not really legal response from uh, China, that's one. And the second thing is that uh, we need some principles, you know, uh, US action toward China may be viewed as just a balancing against China, which is a some kind of theoretically realistic response. But as uh, President-elect Biden said, a some kind of you know, principled uh, pragmatism is very important. So we have to reinforce norm-based order. Then uh, even though we are acting in the same way, we have to suggest a uh, universal norms first uh, in dealing with you know, 5G, uh, South China Sea, you know, Sea Lane, all these things, uh, even though we are coping with Chinese uh, problems, but we have to first agree on the principles, then South Korea can act uh, on the principle of those universal norms, which will give us some excuse or justification to, uh, you know, uh, stand against, in some sense, Chinese uh, influence. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. Dr. Ha, if you have any comments, you're on mute. You're on mute, Dr. Ha. Dr. Ha, you're you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Let me add a couple of things. Uh, President-elect uh, Biden's uh, would like to use the two key words, one as the American leadership instead of America first, second one as the exa example of democracy rather than peace through strength as uh, President Trump uh, usually used two words. Uh, but we, it is a very much uh, uh, better shift or better changes for not only for the United States, but also globe as a whole. But one thing I would like to mention is that as we all know we are now just entering the so-called post-COVID-19 uh, uh, world order. In that sense, I think the situation will be changed very rapidly. As we all know, not only the United States, but also China uh, has not very much successful to manage the current crisis. So, what will be the next uh, key environment, key issues we are facing? I think the another more key word might be the complexity rather than the traditional uh, key principles of words we used uh, during the previous world order. In that sense, I think both the ROK and US uh, can cooperate it. How to implemented that kind of the new situation of complexity. For instance, in the case of actors, complexity of actors in, the, in that cases, uh, it is critical how we should manage the China as a, a part of the complex actors in this arena. Second, in the uh, complexity of stage, as a uh, value or norm uh, stages, democracy is rapidly emerging during the uh, Biden ad ad administration, but it is also considered, well, we should also very much uh, well aware of the importance of the 
prudent diplomacy stages, and the final uh, complexity of performances. So far, we are usually very much get used to the cooperation, competitions, or the conflicts. But in a long-term perspective, in the era of post-19 uh, world order, I think symbiosity might be the another key word. In that sense, I think ROK and US can be a face will face the much more broader arenas we can cooperate, I think. Thank you. Um, it, Dr. Lee, um, you know, one of the uh, findings of your, or some of the recommendation in your paper was that the US should, um, as you looked at some of the demographics, the younger generation, um, that you recommend the US um, employ a more, more public diplomacy on soft power type of relationships. Um, can you elaborate on that um, and how, and what, and you know, I'm, I'm reminded of what Dr. Chun had said about um, returning to principles, these norms, right? Um, uh, is, uh, you know, what kind of soft power diplomacy or public diplomacy were you um, thinking about as you were writing this paper and providing these recommendations? Well, um, you remember uh, the um, what the you know national confidence and the democratization of South Korea. We had subscribed anti-American sentiments in early 2000s and and also in late 1990s to the base issues and then the uh, environmental issues, and that was peaked in 2002 the massive candlelight protest uh, due to Hyosun Mison, uh, this uh, tragic uh, death of two schoolgirls that had led to the public demand to revise so far um, the status of forces agreement uh, because many Koreans felt uh, it, uh, our national sovereignty was infringed. Ever since uh, the, uh, the US armies in South Korea uh, had done very good job in you know, reaching the communities and doing some, some kind of uh, public diplomacy. And also uh, the, um, the uh, American government overall, I think a very um, um, cautious and, and more trying to engage the, uh, the South Koreans uh, in a equal footing, uh, respecting South Korea as a, a partner rather than the, the client of American patriot. So in that matter, I think uh, the president elect Biden's approach to South Korea um, as an important ally, uh, he has emphasized that he will respect the, the alliance partners and South Korea is one of them. So I think in that matter, many Koreans feel uh, will be a little bit, uh, you know, ease it from the pressure to increase uh, the hosting the uh, US armies in South Korea. Uh, and then um, we worried about the President Trump's transition approach to the chorus um, uh, alliance at uh, the US Korea alliance. And even we worry that he may withdraw American armies from South Korea. So that kind of worries, you know, kind of disappear. And that's uh, the sign. So I think that, that kind of public diplomacy, President himself, and also, of course, state, uh, uh, the uh, top leaders in the State Department and the American Embassy in Korea, uh, they are all important. Um, and also uh, the one great things I uh, observing these days is that South Korean government and many leaders are kind of moving towards the regional and global corporations in democracy and health, especially after pandemic. And, and this day, the climate change. Now, the, uh, President Moon has introduced the Green New Deal and, and, and tonight's uh, news I heard uh, President Moon pledged a commitment of 10 million of vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccines to developing countries. 
So all these signs are very good uh, to reciprocate President-elect Biden's gesture to engage the partner allies in, in a more wider uh, regional and global agenda. Thank you. Um, you know, when we talk about this regional order, um, Jonathan, um, Lindsay, or anybody on the panel, um, can the U.S. accept China as a co-equal major power, Jonathan? Uh, that is what, uh, in an American context, we might call the $64 question. Um, uh, I think um, what we confront with China is obviously a country whose uh, internal norms, um, some of its really uh, hideous policies um, directed in, in Xinjiang against the Uyghur minority, uh, highly punitive policies towards Hong Kong, um, worries about the relationship uh, with Taiwan, um, all are front and center. Uh, these are decisions that the leadership of China is making. We might judge them very unwise and even ominous. Um, but for now, those are where their priorities have gone. And we should be candid about this, John. Um, if, if I look back on the record of the Trump administration, um, uh, it has seemed at times almost eager to make this relationship as difficult and as problematic as possible in essence, uh, questioning whether there was a legitimacy to those who govern China. Uh, and some people look at much of what the administration has said, including Pompeo, even in recent days, are kind of goading China in ways that will uh, provoke Chinese nationalism one way or another. None of this is an endorsement of China and its priorities, but the reality of China as the world's second biggest power uh, and that the United States and China will be the preeminent powers in the world for as far as we can see are facts. The question is what kind of a competition exists? Competition is not an inherently bad word. The question, does it go uh, overtly in very adversarial directions? If so, that creates enormous complexity to use uh, Professor Ha's word uh, for a position of a state like the ROK. Um, so that one way or another, uh, it does seem to me, uh, we have to test the possibilities, uh, even as we have profound differences with China in so many areas of where our interests do overlap, whether it is, as mentioned before, about COVID, mentioned about climate change, non-proliferation, a host of other er areas that um, the reality of China can't be denied. However, we object so much to China's internal course of action. Um, let me though, if I could raise one or two other issues very, very quickly that go in this context. This has been a very, very lively and interesting discussion. It seems to me I'm hearing very, very different maps of the future uh, coming from different panelists. We might say uh, there is the, uh, from the point of view of South Korean threat perception, um, how does South Korea divide up uh, its attention and its interest with respect to North Korea, with respect to China, and then what uh, Lindsay very usefully raised with respect to Asia as a whole. These are all very, very different. Can, um, can, can South Korea, as we might say, walk and chew gum at the same time? Um, there is also, to be very, very frank, uh, there's the question of Japan. Um, so when I listen to these conversations about affirming the importance of US alliance relations in East Asia, ones that I endorse very, very strongly, I'm still left troubled to say the least by the absolute inability of Japan and Korea to arrive at some tolerable set of understandings about the long-term future. Uh, they are each going their separate ways and when, um, when allies of the United States um, are articulating very, very different policy directions, um, this is very, very unhealthy for the kind of larger long-term issues that we would wish to see if there is to be a coalescence among um, the democracies of East Asia uh, on, on the road ahead. To the degree that they are very divided, 
um, that is like a gift to China. Uh, and this is something I think that the citizens of South Korea have to address. I would also like to see um, President Moon think more about these possibilities at the same time that we have a new possibly interim leadership in Japan. Uh, if we just persist in the same old habits, um, we're not gonna make the kind of headway that we need to. One final comment, um, uh, Mark Knapper emphasized that it's really, you know, we, we don't wanna really get all that involved in all of this. I beg to differ. Uh, unless and until the United States demonstrates uh, a capacity here not to referee a dispute, but to push, frankly, Japan and South Korea to different understandings about the future, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, and um, I don't think that we want to uh, miss the opportunity that exists now that we have collectively dodged the bullet, if you will, of the most destructive president presidency in American history, uh, that the alliance persists, uh, support for it is there. I am very heartened by that. Uh, let's just not, let's just reflect candidly and truly deeply on um, how we proceed ahead in a way that strengthens uh, common interests. Uh, and, and reduces the possibility of damage. Others are watching us right now. Uh, let's, let's do this right, if we can. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, I think you bring up the, the question that I wanted to direct at Lindsay first, and maybe for the South, Kore or South Korean colleagues to comment. Um, Lindsay, you've pointed in your paper um, and elsewhere that there's a tension between um, the broad Indo-Pacific um, and some other uh, uh, visions um, versus South Korea's focus on the peninsula um, and how, uh, and I think Jonathan um, was, was referring to this, um, that limits some of South Korea's aspirations and goals uh, on the new Southern policy uh, and its influence in the region. Can you talk about that? And maybe we can ask our South Korean colleagues to respond. Sure, thanks, John. Um, you know, for a long time, uh, the Alliance, as well as the South Korean government, have been quite focused on the peninsula. And let's be clear, that makes a lot of sense. Um, because when you have a, um, a neighbor to the north that is seeking nuclear weapons, there is a need to focus on security at home. So I don't think acknowledging that there has been a very peninsular focus, both in the alliance and in South Korean foreign policy, necessarily um, is a critique or anything that does not make sense. It certainly does. But I think when you look forward to where South Korea is going as a country, it is increasingly um, building economic ties with not just neighbors, but around the world. We heard Mark Naver earlier talking about areas where South Korea has made tremendous contributions globally. But there has been, um, and, and I have heard former Assistant Secretary of Defense, Randy Shriver describe it this way, almost sort of a, a gap or a, a donut hole in, in alliance cooperation between what we do on the peninsula and what we do globally, where the region is missing. Um, and that doesn't make a lot of sense because arguably um, that's the area where South Korea has the greatest degree of interest, far more than in the Middle East or elsewhere in the world in its own neighborhood. And so together as the Alliance and you know, also as a part of the Moon administration's new Southern policy, um, I think there's room to think about how South Korea contributes more in the region. The new Southern policy, um, has, has done a lot in terms of putting forward sort of a vision on the diplomatic and on um, the economic side. It mentions um, peace and security, but I think as of yet, it's not totally clear what contributions the new Southern policy might make that are more focused on security or defense. So I think that as a place to start, um, the Moon administration could perhaps begin building out and articulating what its vision of sort of a security focused pillar of the new Southern policy could look like. Um, and I think it was Dr. Chun who spoke earlier about sort of grounding this in principles for the region. I think that's very sensible. Um, 
I think what you really need is a sense from the Moon administration, if there is this multilateral architecture, what does South Korea see as its own place in that architecture? What priorities would it have for that type of architecture? Um, and perhaps those are the kinds of conversations that in the strategic dialogue we were talking about, you can have because um, these mini lateral networks that have been evolving in the region, the reality is, particularly on the defense side, South Korea has really been absent. There is a relationship, a trilateral dialogue between Japan and South Korea and the US, but it's been, it's been difficult to move that forward. There hasn't been similar cooperation with some of the other countries. And so I think if South Korea can come in and say, this is how the new Southern policy contributes to peace and security. This is where we see our role in moving some of these priorities forward in the region. Then that creates the space to begin building those discrete, um, I guess, links between the hubs and the hub and spoke system. Thanks, Lindsay. Let me weave in a question from the audience before um, I asked the South Korean um, colleagues to, to comment. Um, North Korea is always the outlier here. Um, and it always seems to be hijacking um, and constraining South Korea's policy choices um, because as Dr. Chun and Dr. Ha and Lee have, have mentioned before, uh, South Korea is, uh, needs China uh, or perceives that it needs China um, to deal with the North Korea problem. So let me, let me um, toss it out to um, uh, Drs. Chun, Ha and Lee for their final thoughts on all of this. Well, okay, uh, let, me, let me first speak a little bit. You know, there are many questions. Uh, those are very important questions. First, where are uh, South Korea positions in dealing with regional security architecture? Uh, I think just uh, we are entering into the period of US-China rivalry. You know, in 2013, there was a statement by President Obama and Xi Jinping about the new model of great power uh, cooperation, not competition. So it's just five or six years old when we talk about US China rivalry. So we have to uh, have some time of adjustment to this grand structural transformation. And South Korea has adopted to US unipolarity relatively peaceful period. So we have to deal with our economic dependence on China. You know, our 70% of the national income comes from the export and 27% of export come from China. So probably 20% of our GDP comes from China. We, but anyway, we already felt the need to diversify our economic relations because China sometimes weaponized the interdependence uh, in an economic sense. And in dealing with North Korean problem, you know, as uh, Dr. Chung said, uh, there is a perception in South Korea, we need some kind of assistance from China, or at least we have to prevent uh, South Korea sanction evasion. So we have to deal with China anyway, uh, but uh, we have a strong need to deal with uh, North Korea's denuclearization. So at some point, uh, probably we will have some other opportunity, but right now we uh, have should have some relations with China. Uh, in Korea-Japan relations, I think uh, it might be historic problem, but uh, it's also a structural problem because the rise of military China is a chance for Japan to uh, militarize or normalize uh, Japan's position. But as I said, you know, the rise of China is a problem for South Korea uh, for, de uh, for denuclearization of North Korea. So there is a different interest structure, not just historical problem. And the United States may find a leeway to adjust these differences between two. Uh, countries. And lastly, uh, South Korea's position in regional architecture uh, in terms of security, I think we need some time. But basically, <laughs> South Korea feels that uh, we should have a stable uh, regional order. We know that we have to care about, you know, the South China Sea in terms of sea lane, uh, maritime disputes, which will in the long run affect South Korea's security position. We are right now dealing with non-traditional security at least. But uh, I think South Korea will have some kind of very concrete indicator to show how China's rise will give us a security threat. So if, if we uh, have that 
very um, concrete uh, measure how to deal with you know China's rise in terms of security threat, then uh, at some point, if necessary, uh, we have to deal with those traditional type of security architecture problem uh, as time goes by. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ha or Dr. Lee, uh, do you have any five or 10 seconds of uh, final thoughts? Five seconds. Five seconds. Uh, Korean issue actually is not only for the Korean issues, in particular in the arena of military matters, uh, Peace on the Korean Peninsula is not the peninsula matters. It's also the, one of the critical matters for the regional architecture and also the global architecture. In that sense, I think we do rather successfully uh, play the role of national, regional, global role at the same time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to uh, respond to Lindsay's point that the South Korea is active in peninsula and also in the globe, but bypassing region. Um, I think uh, it is related to the increasing uh, dilemma and uh, of uh, re resolving the nuclear issue of North Korea because of this North Korean threat became so uh, immense to South Korea. Uh, I think uh, our imagination of regional policy has been more in you know, a narrowed. But if you look at the before, like uh, Kim Dae-jung period, we had a great region of East Asia. And then when we move to Northeast Asia, uh, we have a NAPSI and, and many other great ideas building up the peace cooperation, uh, you know, focusing on North Korea, but it's not successful because they are North Korea is, uh, you know, crowded with uh, very strong countries. So that's why we became kind of weakened, uh, you know, the, the taking back East Asia again. And just one second uh, for the Japan, Korea, this uh, issues. And, and I like to say there are a lot of government leadership failure from both countries, but many private sector including East Asia, we like to, we, we think uh, the good relationship with Japan is critical to the peninsula and to the region. Thank you so much um, to all of our distinguished panelists. Thank you for a lively conversation this morning and to everyone in the audience who joined us. Um, with deep apologi apologies to the president of uh, East Asia Institute, uh, Yul Sun, who is moderating our, our second panel. Um, thank you to all of you. Uh, Dr. Son, over to you. Good, good. Well, um, something happened to me. <laughs> um, once again, uh, let me open panel two. Um, my name is Yol Son, uh, president of EAI and Yonsei University professor. Uh, I'm the moderator uh, of this uh, panel. Um, I, uh, I'd like to, um, first of all, um, uh, introduce uh, the panelists, uh, uh, but I already, uh, you know, spent uh, some time, so uh, the introduction uh, should be uh, brief. I'm sorry about that. Um, first of all, uh, from um, uh, Brookings, uh, Jeffrey uh, Ball um, is a non-resident senior fellow in the Energy Security and Climate Initiative at Brookings and a scholar at Stanford University's uh, Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy. Um, next, uh, David Dollar um, is a senior fellow in the John Thornton China Center at Brookings and a leading expert on US-China uh, economic relations. Um, and uh, next to uh, Samantha Groth um, is a, a fellow and director of the Energy Security uh, and Climate Initiative at Brookings. Um, and finally, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Mireya Solis, uh, who is a director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies, uh, Philip Knight Chair in Japanese Studies, um, and a senior fellow in the foreign policy program at Brookings. Um, let me um, turn to uh, EAI scholars, uh, Young Jabe, um, 
is a professor of the Department of Political Science and Diplomacy at Kangook University. She is an expert in political economy of technology. Uh, and uh, Wang Hui Li uh, is a professor of political science and a dean of the Division of International Studies at Aju University. He is an I IPE scholar in, in Chinese studies. Um, let uh, the theme uh, of, of panel two um, is uh, when we saw uh, in the panel one, um, you know, it, it deals with the interplay of uh, you know strategic interest and values um, in in dealing with uh, China challenge, and here um, our session it, it's more of an interplay of. Uh, you know, national security, strategic interest, and economic interdependence. Um, for uh, United States and South Korea, uh, United States, uh, you know, can leverage its power to increase its strategic and economic uh, counterbalance to China. Uh, but South Korea is uh, is forced to play a much uh, complex game that we, we uh, saw in the earlier panel. Uh, given its uh, deep uh, yet uh, asymmetric economic interdependence with uh, China, and also demands for uh, you know Chinese cooperation with regard to uh, North Korean problems uh, threats, uh, South Korea needs to accommodate China, uh, while at the same time courting uh, U.S. engagement uh, militarily, but also economically. For example, you know advanced technology. Technology, so it, it's very uh, complex, um, you know, game for South Korea, both uh, you know, uh, in terms of security and economics. So, in that sense, two countries uh, really need a, a strategic consultation and coordination over complex interdependence in in, in uh, the range of issue areas. Um, I. Um, uh, like to raise uh, three uh, kind of you know broad issues. One is. Uh, sort of, you know, significant development in, in, in trade, investment, development, and energy, um, which is a, a negative nexus of uh, economics and politics security that uh, the, the latter part of, of the previous session dealt with, um, you know, weaponized trade and interdependence by uh, invoking national security. Um, you know, South Korea underwent, uh, you know, sad retaliation by China, and uh, U.S. countervailing duties in the name of Section 232 uh, on, on steel and aluminum, and the Japanese uh, export controls over, you know, chemical components, um, you know, crucial to uh, South Korean semiconductor industry. So all these um, are uh, re uh, related to national security questions. So how can we uh, restrain um, you know, abusing or overusing, invoking a uh, broader definition of national security and, and strike a, a right balance of uh, national security and economic interdependence. That's uh, one um, issue. And that comes down to the China challenge. And uh, clearly Chinese uh, mercantilist uh, behavior is just disrupting trade, you know, bilateral and global. And um, there are economic problems, definitely uh, market barriers need to be addressed and dismantled. Um, so in that sense, there needs to needs a collective approach to China uh, from United States and Korea. And, um, you know, likewise, uh, we need to kind of, you know, distinguish um, sort of, you know, addressing uh, economic problems in China market um, and, sort of, you know, deterring and, and slowing down a, a Chinese rising by invoking national, uh, you know, security concerns. So how do we um, distinguish these two and then make a right policy? Um, and thir third, um, also sort of, you know, reflecting the previous uh, session, there's a compelling need, particularly in, in the realm of economy and, 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 and energy, uh, for rules-based economic order in the region that restrains uh, Chinese predation, American protectionism, um, sort of you know, increased middle power spaces, um, you know, sustain global norms, I mean, liberal norms. So um, can um, 
Biden administration move in that direction? And also can uh, the Moon government uh, move beyond the traditional bilateralism of you know, negotiating bilateral FTAs, then more uh, proactively engage in plurilateral, multilateral collective approach? That's uh, uh, the question we would like to ask. Um, and um, for the order of uh, today's uh, you know, discussion, we have uh, more or less uh, three on, on trade and tax. So we go first uh, on that issue and then move to energy and environment. So um, let me go uh, the order, like, you know, start from uh, Dr. David Dollar and then Young Jabe, Mira Solis, and then move to energy, uh, Samantha Grove. Uh, Wang Jin Li, and finally Jeffrey Ball. And then we get to a lightly moderated uh, discussion. Um, and if time allows, we get to uh, um, um, audience questions. Um, for, uh, uh, you know, audience questions, I think uh, it's the same as uh, Zhang uh, mentioned before. So uh, please uh, give us uh, the email, uh, I mean, uh, the questions. Uh, uh, while we are, we are discussing and then later we collect and, and, and present it. So uh, let me, uh, with that said, um, you know, I, uh, first of all, I, 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 I uh, want to uh, ask uh, um, Dr. David Dollar, um, the China challenge is to be understood, like I said, as an economic problem uh, in your view, what are the real economic obstacles presented in, in China and how can we address them? In what ways uh, United States and, and South Korea coordinate to deal with it? You um, unmute, please. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to join this distinguished panel. Uh, looking at the US-China economic relationship, the United States has a lot of different issues with China, and I think South Korea shares some of the concerns, but not necessarily all of the concerns. You know, first, the U.S. has raised a set of macroeconomic issues concerning trade balances and currency, and frankly, I don't see a lot of sympathy among economists or among our partners in Asia. Uh, China's overall trade surplus has been very small for years, its currency is appreciated very significantly. So I, I think it's been a, a bit of a side distraction for the US to be pushing these macro issues. Having said that, there's a whole range of micro issues which Chairman Yulsun already referred to uh, that are a serious set of issues for the US and for others. And not to go into too much detail, but I would just point to some Chinese trade practices that are out of line with global norms. Uh, China is very protectionist about cross-border data flows, for example. Uh, intellectual property rights protection is weak. There's a whole set of service industries where direct investment into China is restricted, and that makes it very hard to have trade in services if you can't have investment. And then you have the issue of research and development subsidies. We, we all do subsidies to R&D. The question is, are they generic uh, tax breaks for R&D, building up universities, improving your intellectual property rights, these kind of general measures, or are you targeting specific technologies with subsidies? And it's the latter that, that we find offensive. Now, these issues have become so serious that you hear a lot of talk in the United States about decoupling the US economy from the Chinese economy. I don't think this is realistic at all. And I don't see that our partners like South Korea have any appetite for decoupling. So I think there's a bit of a argument between do we separate from China completely or do we try to address these specific practices that I measured, mentioned. So I think it makes sense for US, South Korea and other partners to coordinate on trying, trying to address these Chinese practices. I would say that's already implicit in our chorus agreement, which has chapters on cross-border data flows, intellectual property rights, subsidies, et cetera. And so the natural issue is how to expand. Uh, 
neither the US nor South Korea is in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So when we think about expanding this kind of cooperation, there's the global level where the ideal would be a new WTO agreement, but that seems very far off. A second best would be for the US and South Korea and other Asian countries to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm sure we'll get into that in more detail, but I think frankly for the United States, that's a very heavy lift. I wouldn't expect the Biden administration to get into that quickly. A possible third best would be to pick a subset of the TPP countries, which basically would be the advanced capitalist democracies. So Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and then bring in South Korea and the United States. You could imagine a plurilateral grouping of Asia Pacific democracies uh, that advanced economies where the United States could join that kind of agreement without the kind of controversy that would come from joining the TPP. Uh, so I think that that's an interesting idea worth exploring. I don't want to go on for too long, so I just want to make the general point that uh, I think the, the larger issue for the United States is this one I mentioned. Do we try to decouple from China or do we try to change Chinese practices? And I really don't think decoupling is practical and it's not gonna have support in Asia. A country like South Korea can play a very useful role influencing the US decision on this. I'm sure President Biden, when he makes his first trip to Asia, he'll probably go to Japan and South Korea, try to bolster the security alliance and there's broad support for that. I'm hoping he'll hear a very strong message that countries like South Korea are deeply integrated with China. They're not interested in decoupling. They're interested in changing Chinese practices. And if the US does not come back into the Asia Pacific economy in a more serious way, then it's gonna make life quite difficult for a country like South Korea. So I haven't given up hope that a couple of years down the road, a Biden administration might be willing to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but it'll have to be hearing powerfully from friends like South Korea that these kind of larger trade agreements are necessary to really set a good foundation for Asia Pacific trade. And so I'll uh, stop there. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, David. Um, yeah, it, it's really, uh, uh, important uh, points, in particular, I think, um, you know, reforms, regulatory reforms in, in, in China, um, it's, uh, it, it's uh, you know, for uh, the third party like, like Korea, if, if US, China, you know, bilateral deals, then sometimes uh, the third party do not enjoy, um, you know, benefits uh, or sort of, you know, multilateral access to uh, Chinese markets. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, that's what I want to um, add. Um, then um, I think uh, uh, the next is, is Young Jape. Um, uh, my uh, question is, um, you know, the forces of U.S.-China uh, rivalry um, are prevalent in, 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 you know, tags like, you know, 5G, uh, AI, and semiconductors. Uh, so for uh, South Korea, it's really, you know, profound concerns. Can you um, explain, um, there are challenges, obviously, but also opportunities uh, for some, you know, high tech, like, you know, Samsung. So what are uh, the challenges and opportunities lying ahead uh, to South Korea? Um, and uh, uh, David just mentioned that if uh, Biden administration push for sort of, you know, collective approach to uh, China, um, for example, tech alliance, things like that, and what that leaves uh, South Korea uh, choice. So um, can, you, um, can you respond? Okay, thank you, Professor Song. Uh, first of all, I'm glad to join this webinar and have a chance to talk on the prospects on US-Korea cooperation. Uh, it is true, the United, U.S. and China technology rivalry have been causing great challenges to many countries, including Korea. In particular, uh, Korean information technology industry 
one of the most dynamic sector in Korea has been developed in an open and integrated global innovation environment with uh, the highly interdependent relations both with the United States and China. The recent U.S. restrictions on transactions with Chinese companies have put Korean IT firms in a complicated situation. For instance, LG U+, one of the three major telecom service firms in Korea, has been using Huawei 4G equipment since uh, 2013, while the U.S. government has continuously demanded to stop using them, in, in particular recently under the Clean Network Initiative. Despite the pressure from the U.S., it's not easy for LG U Plus to disconnect from Huawei because its LTE service supported by Huawei has a high compatibility with the 5G equipment. In the semiconductor sector, the U.S. firms have a clear dominance in chip design, software, and equipment within the global semiconductor supply chain. And Korean semiconductor firms like Samsung have no other choice than to use them and comply with U.S. requests. At the same time, however, China has been a major market, uh, market uh, ac accounting for about half of the Korean semiconductor exports. Huawei, one of the five biggest customers for Samsung, have purchased more than 8 billion US dollar worth of Korean chips annually. LG U Plus, Samsung, and many other Korean companies doing business with Chinese firms are expected to bear heavy costs and losses in replacing Chinese supplier and market in the short term. However, over the long term, it is true that this situation could serve as an opportunity for the Korean firms to expand their market share and secure new clients on behalf of Chinese firms. In order to take advantage of this situation, Korean firms should accelerate innovation by widening the technological gap with a Chinese competitor. I think from a viewpoint of Korean firms, this is the reason that U.S.-Korean technology cooperation needs to be advanced further. On the second question, I think in the Biden administration, the pressure against China are expected to continue, maybe in a somewhat relaxed form, and the formation of technology alliance in line, in line with grand multilateral strategy against China could be discussed uh, in detail. In fact, uh, various versions of a technology alliance have been proposed. For example, a recent National Security Commission on AI interim report suggested a very specific proposal to strengthen technology alliances with India and Europe in AI sector. Uh, whether in the form of an alliance or in any in any other ways, I think the U.S. and Korea should move forward on technology cooperation at various levels. At the government level, the Joint SNP Committee has been held for a long time. It stopped during Trump administration. I think now it's the time that we should restart the committee and search for a new agenda. At the corporate level, the two countries have developed a kind of complementary structure of division of labor in some areas, so it could come up with more specific cooperation projects. I think all of these efforts could naturally lead Korea to deepen technology cooperation with the United States, which may not necessarily exclude the Chinese market. It is my opinion that U.S.-Korea technology cooperation has better proceed under an open innovation environment. It is neither possible nor desirable for both the U.S. and Korea to completely turn away the Chinese market. I think we need to flesh out a way of further SNP cooperation for the continuous growth of both U.S.-Korean economies. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Pei. Um, now, uh, uh, move. Uh, let's move to uh, Mireya. Um, uh, my uh, the question is uh, for uh, 
you know, America's allies and partners uh, in Asia, utmost concern um, that has intensified during the, pre I mean, Trump presidency is, is the U.S. status uh, growing uh, marginalized in the regional economic market architecture. For example, you know, uh, CPTPP U.S. is step out and RCEP U.S. is, is no member. Uh, and also the, you know, trust waning under, you know, aggressive uh, unilateralism. So can the next uh, administration change course? Uh, will it uh, be able to rejoin TPP? I mean, um, David has a pessimistic view, I mean, at, in the short term, uh, and also back to multilateral institutions, I mean, WTO and, and, and um, global leadership, uh, can it restore? So what, what's your view um, on, on, on these uh, the questions? Thank you so much. Those are great questions, tough questions. So uh, let me try to take them on. Um, I see two major challenges for the United States um, going forward. One is, as you mentioned, the growing marginalization from the regional economic architecture, but also the need to repair US credibility, which has been badly damaged after the decision to withdraw from the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, but also because over the past few uh, four years, we saw the Trump administration resort to unilateral tariffs with great abandon. So there's a lot of um, uh, credibility uh, repair uh, boosting that needs to take a place. And let me um, sort of unpack these two challenges. As you mentioned, um, I, the planks of the regional economic architecture are now coming into place. We have now two mega trade agreements, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, which is such a handful, but nevertheless, it's a successor agreement to the original TPP. And what is interesting there is that the remaining countries suspended just a number of provisions so that the United States could find its way back if there was a desire to do so. But nevertheless, they also show that they're prepared to move forward if the United States does not want to join large scale regional or trans-regional trade agreements. So the CPTPP is alive and kicking, uh, so to speak. And now we're about to witness um, a major milestone for the other mega trade agreement, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership without India. And that was uh, a blow to the members, but nevertheless, you're talking about 15 countries that are ready to sign the agreement uh, this uh, weekend. And even though it's not going to be at the level of ambition of the uh, CPTPP, it is important given the size of the economies, it is important because there will be some common rules that will uh, further develop uh, supply chains. Um, so that's you know, an important set of developments and the common denominator there is that the United States is absent. We're not at the table, we're not having voice, we're not having uh, influence. And I think this is a matter of concern. You can actually uh, make the case that the United States has moved in the opposite direction. Many countries in the Indo-Pacific are coming together in these trade agreements. The United States has chosen a different path. Let's not remember that four years ago in the last presidential race, the TPP was a political orphan. There was no candidate to the presidency that wanted to vouch uh, for uh, securing a ratification of the uh, TPP. And one of the first acts of President Trump upon entering into office was to withdraw from the trade agreement. And you know, four years down the road, when we look at the America first trade policy, I think uh, the way I would characterize it is that it's been big in disruption. There's been a lot of upheaval with the US-China trade war, with the uh, use or abuse of national security types that target our allies and our partners. But I think it has actually, when we look at Asia, accomplished modest results. There was a, a small revision to the Korea-US trade agreement that was not trade liberalizing. Then you have the phase one uh, trade agreement with China that did not really touch on the core industrial policy issues that had been of concern. Uh, to the United States and where China is not likely to uh, deliver on the full set of purchasing commitments. And then you have a phase one trade agreement with Japan that is narrow and does not really match the level of ambition of the regional TPP. So to your question, Yul, can the uh, Biden administration change course? Uh, I think it can and I think it will. 
Uh, in which ways? Well, first of all, there will be a return to multilateralism. I think that there will be a more constructive attitude towards fixing some of the problems of the WTO. It's a heavy lift. It will not happen right away. But I desire perhaps to offer a blueprint for reforms of the applet body that many members have been eagerly awaiting for. And also there will be greater emphasis on working with like-minded countries to create coalitions of like-minded countries that could be more effective in trying to secure reforms uh, from China. But, and this is a big but, we should not lose sight of the fact that there will be continuities where there's actually bipartisan support, <laughs> bipartisan consensus in the United States. And these are in the following areas, a tough line on China, because both countries are locked in in a condition of a strategic competition that's not going to change under the Biden administration. I also think that there's strong support for uh, um, the Made in America or Buy America uh, um, platforms, which would mean a tightening of government procurement rules and incentives for onshoring of production. And also I think that um, there will be an appetite for stricter environmental, climate, and labor standards, as we saw uh, um, certainly on environment and labor in the US-Mexico-Canada uh, trade agreement. Nor, and I agree with uh, David here, we should expect that off the bat, the Biden administration will launch into an ambitious trade agenda. The domestic priorities are very big. We're in the middle of a pandemic, economic crisis. We are divided uh, politically. Those issues will uh, certainly command most attention. This does not mean that the United States should stand, uh, stand idly while it addresses these important domestic uh, issues. I think there are things that could be done uh, that would still um, signal to the world and to our Asian partners that the US is ready to re-engage and could pass muster a fact, fractured political system. One would be, for example, to uh, negotiate, take the chapter from the CPTPP on the digital economy and then bring it to the region and have more uh, countries sign on to it. I also think that there could be initiatives to keep medical supplies, um, uh, uh, medical supply chains open at the time of the pandemic and to develop trusted supplier initiatives uh, for supply chain uh, resilience. Uh, but down the road, and I'm here, I'm going to stop and uh, so I don't uh, monopolize the conversation. I do think that down the road, the right call, it will not happen immediately, but the right call would be to seek admission into the CPTPP. Uh, that is the agreement that is in force. The original TPP was not ratified by the remain, uh, remaining countries. That is the agreement that's there. Starting from scratch, a new negotiation and seven years of uncertainty would not do. I think that from the point of view of the United States, there could be targeted revisions to bring in environmental and labor standards. And from the point of view of existing TPP countries, it's a, um, the risks are less, if you will, because being an accession negotiation, it means that if the United States does not come on board for some reason, the entire enterprise is not brought down. The CPPT continues. Uh, but also I think that the uh, uh, CPTP countries would have asks of their own. And uh, probably they will ask US unilateralism to be attained. And this could come in the form of the United States agreeing not to bypass the uh, dispute settlement mechanism of the CPTPP with a unilateral 301 action. The greater benefit of this, of course, is that we would also facilitate South Korea's entry into the CPTPP, which I think is an agreement that has the most ambitious uh, standards. And would also with the United States, with South Korea, with the UK and so forth, this could really provide a shot in the arm to the agreement to convince others uh, to join. So I stop here. Thank you, uh, great intervention. Um, yeah, I, um, I uh, have to resist, um, you know, temptation to continue our T CPTPP, but um, you know, we, uh, we need to talk uh, now um, about uh, you know energy and environment. Um, our uh, next speaker uh, is Samantha. Um, in the context of uh, U.S.-China strategic uh, competition, at issue is how energy sector uh, is played out. Right. So um, when uh, we look at um, the rising, uh, you know, national natural gas market, energy market, uh, US, China, South Korea, Japan, right? All complement with each other, um, you know, in the market. 
but trade wars are here and also uh, can you think of any important developments driven by energy security or broader you know strategic calculations that affect the flow of uh, you know trade production and things and what can in that uh, regard one can possibly uh, United States and South Korea do collectively? Thank you for your question. And um, it's a pleasure to be with you all, at least virtually. Um, development of LNG supply in the United States is really an area where the United States, China, and South Korea's interests are very much aligned. South Korea and China, or China and South Korea are the second and third largest markets for LNG, respectively, with Japan as number one. Um, and so clearly they have an interest in abundant and well-priced LNG supply. And the growth in the US gas supply has meant that United States producers are looking for customers. Because a lot of the natural gas that's produced in the United States is pr produced alongside oil, with oil being the primary product that they're looking for, there's an overabundance of natural gas in the United States. And that natural gas is very well-priced. And so, Asian um, demand is really excited to have access to that supply. And it's also priced quite differently than, natural, than LNG that you see from other places. In many places, because there's not a liquid market to allow price discovery based on gas on gas competition, LNG is priced based on oil prices. Whereas in the United States, we have a very deep and liquid market that allows price discovery at Henry Hub. So instead, US LNG is priced based on Henry Hub prices, plus fees for liquefaction and transport. And so this gas allows Asian gas producers to have some diversity in their pricing, and also for them to access the very liquid and low priced market typically that we have here in the United States. And so this is just a real opportunity for Asian um, buyers. Also, as the United States have, has come into the market, um, it's become more of a buyer's market because they've provided extra supply. But they've also changed some contract terms. Contract terms are less rigid than they used to be. Um, typically LNG contracts have what they call um, destination clauses that don't allow that gas to be sold elsewhere. Whereas many US gas contracts have eliminated those clauses. So all of these things make US natural gas supply really attractive to those in Asia, particularly Japan, China, and South Korea, the, three, the world's three largest markets. And thinking of this on a more strategic level, this natural gas can be really helpful to all of these economies as they work to diversify their electricity generation away from coal, both for reasons of local air pollution, particularly in China, but also for reasons of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and dealing with global climate change. And so this supply sounds like it's great for everyone, right? This is a win-win for all and I can stop talking. But the challenge here is that the US-China trade war has really thrown a wrench into the works. Um, and China in retaliation for things that the United States has done has put tariffs on US LNG starting at 10% and now up to 25% um, starting in June, 2019. And so this has greatly slowed Chinese Chinese purchases of US LNG. So before COVID really took off, the US and China reached a deal in January of this year, pushing China to buy $23.5 billion of US energy products this year. Um, this isn't gonna happen um, for a number of reasons. It was ambitious to begin with. With the economic um, slowdown that we've seen due to COVID, um, that's reduced energy demand globally. And also because this deal is priced in dollars and not in volumes, as energy prices have declined, as demand has declined, um, making those goals even more difficult to reach in dollar terms. So what now? Um, the incoming Biden administration has an interesting challenge with respect to natural gas, um, politically. Replacing coal in Asia is good for greenhouse gas emissions and is a goal that I think all of us can support, including those in the incoming Biden administration. Um, but LNG projects will get pushback from the left flank of 
um, the incoming Biden administration. We're really opposed to any additional fossil fuel development infrastructure, et cetera. But overall, I think um, the central part of the Biden administration and President-elect Biden himself is really pragmatic about this. He understands that it's good for the United States and for our Asian allies for LNG development to continue. He said that he will not ban hydraulic fracturing, the main technology along with horizontal drilling that has made all this gas production possible. Um, and I think there's really room for the United States and South Korea to cooperate on a global well-supplied LNG market. It's to Korea's advantage to help us resolve this dispute for China, to have robust LNG supply. My concern is if this dispute continues with China, that you'll see a slowdown in development of US LNG and projects delaying or not coming to final investment decision because they're concerned about their access to the Chinese market. This is bad for everyone. It's bad for the United States. It's bad for our Asian allies and customers. And it's bad for greenhouse gas emissions as this gas is primarily being used to push coal out of the power sector. So if President Biden can sell this here in the United States as a positive for greenhouse gas emissions and we can work with our customers in Asia to make this happen, um, this is very helpful. Gas may not be the final destination for greenhouse gas um, removal, but it's definitely helpful in the short term as the world is pushing towards a mid-century decarbonization goal. So there's a lot to be done between now and then. And I think the incoming administration um, will be willing to work with our customers to keep this gas flowing and to help resolve the, um, the really antagonistic trade relationship that we've had with China. Um, I think that will be a difficult thing to do, but I think that energy products and particularly natural gas are a good place to start with this because our interests are so obviously aligned. So with that, thanks to everyone and I'll pass it back to Dr. Song. Wonderful. Um, now uh, let's, uh, let's turn to uh, Professor Wang He Lee. Um, just uh, as, as Martha said, that you know there is a good uh, story of uh, energy cooperation in the region, uh, particularly U.S.-China energy cooperation in clean energy and natural gas. Uh, what are um, your some you know key takeaways from uh, that history as a reference for uh, U.S.-Korea uh, energy cooperation? In particular, um, I think I, I read your uh, paper. You mentioned uh, that uh, both. In the Moon government and, and in Biden uh, administration pledge a Green New Deal. And uh, you said there are uh, rooms for cooperation. Can you uh, elaborate more on that? Oh, thank you, Professor Son. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, now, I'm, now I'm going to talk about the Korea US energy cooperation. Uh, as you know, Korea has been a military ally and FTA partner over the past decades. But uh, strangely enough, Korea has little experience in energy cooperation with America. For this reason, I look at the uh, Sino-US energy relations as a reference case. I think that the uh, decades long uh, cooperation between US and China has a significant policy implication for Korea. Uh, yes, uh, cooperation. But the first session is full of rhetorics of competition and rivalry. <laughs> but in terms of energy and climate change, we can talk about cooperation even between America and China, which has been uh, largely forgotten recently. But anyway, the first implication is that bilateral cooperation between the US and China has fluctuated widely between the low carbon option and a high carbon one. Until the mid-2010s, uh, the aim of cooperation has had centered on clean energy to prevent uh, climate change. The Obama administration treated uh, environmental policy as a key uh, policy agenda at summit meetings and the strategic and economic dialogues. However, under the uh, Trump administration, energy cooperation has undergone fundamental changes. Since the uh, shale gas revolution, the U.S. has emerged as the largest oil and natural gas producer 
and President Trump has actively promoted the export of surplus resources. As a result, energy cooperation means nowadays China's purchase of U.S. oil and gas. Uh, let me move on to the, uh, the second implication. China and U.S. are the uh, world's two largest energy consumer and CO2 emitters. Their way of cooperation will have a profound impact on East Asian countries. If the U.S. and China opt for the high carbon cooperation, Korea and probably Japan will increase import of oil and uh, LNG from America. Conversely, if the U.S. and China turn to low carbon cooperation, Korea and Japan will be pressured to reduce carbon emission as early as possible. We can draw a valuable lesson from the experience of si uh, Sino-U.S. energy relations. In America, as you know well, there are opposing views on climate change and energy. Energy policies can change depending on which party takes power. Thus, we should consider both views. When America pursues a kind of Green New Deal, clean and renewable energy technology will be the focus of cooperation. In contrast, while America is a net exporting country, oil and gas will be a key role. I think Korea is well positioned to cope with the policy shift in America. On the one hand, Korea is the world's third largest LNG importer and has been the largest importer of U U.S. LNG since uh, 2018. U.S. LNG can help the country diversify its energy supply chain as well as reduce its trade surplus against the U.S. As long as LNG is cheaper than coal, it can increase its export. In this case, I think an energy alliance can be added to the existing military and trade ones. On the other hand, uh, Korea is the first Asian country that introduced a Green New Deal in July 2020. And President Moon Jae-in declared Korea will be the emission-free country by 2050 in October 28. In this respect, I expect Korea can be a perfect partner if a future Biden administration pursue a global Green New Deal. I think it's a time to think, think big and optimistic. My presentation stuff here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Um, very interesting um, talk. And, and let's uh, move to our uh, uh, final uh, uh, presentation, individual presentation, Jeffrey um, Ball. Um, Given uh, your, um, uh, I mean, your paper uh, talk that uh, there's an entrenched interest uh, sustaining dominant system of high carbon, uh, particularly in the advanced industrial countries and, and also in, in um, Asia, Asia Pacific, um, I, I, I read it and, and I, I feel shame on, on um, the Korean government, I mean, Korean sector. Uh, there's a paradox in which, uh, you know, those countries uh, make transition to decarbonization domestically while exporting, um, you know, coal technology and those uh, related infrastructure. Um, how can we overcome such uh, contradiction? Um, can you can you suggest the ways that enable you know key countries to cooperate? Uh, low carbon, uh, which in turn helps to alleviate uh, possibly geopolitical rivalry. Dr. Sun, thanks for the invitation. And, and let me just say that if, if there's reason for shame in, in South Korea, there's reason for shame in the United States and in China and most other industrialized countries as well. Um, and I guess I'll just say as a, by way of outset too that I fear I'm gonna be a little more pessimistic than some of the others on the panel. But, but let me just try to quickly frame this. I, I think there absolutely will be, <clears throat> excuse me, will be a geopolitical rivalry for dominance in the shift toward cleaner energy. 
there already is over everything from solar panels to batteries to electric cars. A number of people on this panel have referred to trade tariff fights and, and that exists in, in, in the clean energy realm as well. It seems to me that the, the geopolitical goal in clean energy ought to be twofold. One is to ensure that the rivalry is in the right direction, which is to say shifting to cleaner technologies rather than, than preserving dirtier ones. And second is that to ensure that each country in the rivalry has done its own strategic analysis so that it has a sense of where in the global clean energy industry it's likeliest to play competitively. And that's gonna require not just making clean energy cheaper, but also helping the very large swath of, of each of these economies that for decades has profited from dirty energy to reorient itself. That is to say that the economic challenge in the clean energy shift is not just a broad one, although it's often discussed that way, not just a broad question of whether dirty energy or clean energy is cheaper. It's also really importantly a narrow one, and that is who, not just among countries, but within countries, wins and loses from this shift, and how to cushion the blow for the losers so that they don't politically block the broader shift. And that means at the end of the day that, that, that what is broadly construed as a global geopolitical challenge of shifting to cleaner energy sources, to lower carbon energy sources, um, is likely to devolve into a host of very messy domestic political fights. So let me just take a couple more minutes and I, I wanna do kind of two things. I wanna just review where we are in terms of energy uh, and the politics around clean energy. And then I wanna make a, a couple of suggestions. So very, very quickly to, re to, to review where we are. Three, three points I wanna make. Number one, the cost of renewable energy has cratered, has fallen dramatically in the last 10 years or so. Last year around the world, fully 72%, nearly three quarters of all the electricity capacity added in the world was from renewable energy. That's an extraordinary figure. Um, and, and so um, the, what that means is that in much of the world, ex ex expanding electricity capacity with renewable energy is at least in some accounting cheaper than doing it with fossil fuels. Number two, for all that wonderful news, fossil fuels still dominate globally. Uh, fossil fuels accounted for 88% of all energy in 2019 globally. And they are expected, if I were doing this and the audience were live, I would ask people to give me this number, but, but we're doing this on Zoom, so I'll give people the number. We're, eight, we're at 80% now, and in 2040, according to a very respected uh, source, we're likely to be at 72% renewable energy. So that's a, that's a change, but it's not a huge change. Coal is the, the world's biggest single source of electricity now and is expected to remain so in 2040. Um, and number three, in large part for that reason, global greenhouse ga gas emissions continue to rise. And yet experts tell us that to prevent really serious uh, damage from climate change, emissions will have to fall to net zero by 2050. Now, um, Professor Lee just reminded us that um, there have been pledges to go to net zero by 2050. And indeed, Korea has made such a pledge. Moon Jae-in made, made a pledge just less than a month ago. The, the European Union made a pledge like this about a year ago, and it was the EU pledge that sort of started a race among countries. So in the last month, South Korea has made a pledge. The United States under Joe, well, Joe Biden has made a pledge to, go, to, to reduce it, uh, emissions that way. Um, Japan made a pledge. And China, indeed, the world's largest greenhouse gas emission, uh, emitter, pledged that it would uh, uh, reach carbon neutrality, not in 2050, but in 2060. So in the same neighborhood of time. So we are now in the middle of a race. Um, there are huge questions about these pledges though, which is to say um, uh, the extent to which countries are, these countries are, um, how, they're, how they're defining the boundaries of these pledges. So are they considering uh, their carbon emissions only in terms of what they do within their borders? And if that's what they're considering, then this is a really erroneous way to think about things because these countries 
uh, effects on global emissions are largely a function of the money that they invest in building infrastructure in emerging economies. And all of these countries have traditionally been quite significant funders of, among other things, coal-fired power plants in emerging economies. And in, in the context of that, have built up very powerful domestic constituencies around that economic activity. So I'm going on too long here, but I just want to suggest a couple of things um, to do. One of these things is that um, uh, each of these economic powers that has made these pledges to drastically reduce its emissions needs to um, uh, shift financial incentives so uh, that the move to clean energy, to financing clean energy internationally, is as economically attractive for its domestic constituencies as financing dirty energy has been. And that involves a very strate a deep strategic rethink on the part of these countries about where in the value chain they can play. Perhaps we can get into this later in the discussion. The second point is that in all of these countries, and this is, I'll finish up here, but in all of these countries which have been major emitters of technology to burn coal in the emerging, in emerging markets to produce electricity, these countries have to do something quite significant to shift economic incentives so that those those uh, companies that have been engaged in that effort can figure out how to continue to make money and the people who work for them continue to make livelihoods and the politicians who are elected by them continue to get votes uh, in, a cleaner, in a cleaner shift. So uh, research and development spending is quite important in that, but I'll stop there. Thanks. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, I uh, have to say uh, that uh, we are uh, running out of time. We only have uh, 10 minutes um, and uh, we are yet to um, enter uh, the second round of, you know, uh, moderated uh, discussion. Um, uh, so let, let me do it this way. Uh, I'm very sorry about uh, um, you know, questions from the audience are actually not many. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead uh, with with uh, uh, with a question to uh, you. Then anybody can uh, you know uh, uh, intervene. Uh, uh, you know, resonating with with uh, the first panel. Um, you know, security and, and, and economics, uh, so sort of, you know, over securitization or securitization of economic relations. Um, you know, what, 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 what can we do? Um, particularly, uh, you know, the rules-based order um, for security and also for economics, uh, which is uh, really critical. Uh, what are the key steps toward a, a, a rules-based order in the Asia Pacific that supports um, the right balance of uh, economic interdependence and, and some, uh, you know, uh, national security concerns um, invoked by uh, major countries? So, uh, open to you. Uh, anybody can can. Uh, well, I'll just be very, very brief. So I think listening to the two panels, there's broad agreement that like-minded countries need to cooperate on security, strengthen our cooperation. And there are challenges about a rising authoritarian China. So to me, the real critical issue of the time is do we welcome China into the global economic system? Do we continue to have economic integration with China? And I come down strongly in favor of that, partly because I see that the costs of decoupling, not only would they be large for the US, but they would be enormous for South Korea, other Asian Pacific partners. I don't see Asia Pacific partners following the US down a path of real confrontation with China. So this is gonna take some very artful diplomacy to rebuild the security alliance but also try to reform the economic system so we remain relatively open. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you know linking um, security, economics, and values. You say like-minded country. I mean, with with uh, shared values. So Mireya, please. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much, Joel. I think that that really is one of the most significant questions of our time. Uh, I'm very concerned with these arguments that economic security equals national security because then everything goes and then governments can feel that unilaterally they can just, you know, declare some uh, uh, areas of the economy off limits by just articulating a national security logic. I understand that in this context of great power competition, um, more governments uh, are concerned about the possibility of uh, coercive uh, economic uh, diplomacy, and therefore they are, you know, tightening export controls, tightening FDI uh, screening mechanisms, and uh, also pushing for cybersecurity role, uh, rules. Um, but, you know, I think that all these measures uh, can also bring about self-fulfilling uh, prophecies, because in the view of other governments, there could be protectionist intent, they can end up undermining openness and innovation, and they can bring about foreign retaliation. So we really need some kind of balance. So some ideas I would suggest for our discussion is that I would like to see uh, more coordination among countries, economic security dialogues, if you will, to make sure that we don't err on the side of over restrictiveness and that we apply best standards when we think about FDI screening and expert controls. It would also be a mechanism for countries that have disagreements to be able to vent them and air them and hopefully find a solution. I also think the US could do a lot in terms of a what I would regard as a confidence uh, building measure, and that is to tighten its own rules, say the uh, section 232, which allows the US government to impose national security uh, tariffs. The process has been too lax and therefore we have uh, uh, tariffs that do not really accomplish a security goal. So if we were to go back into that and make sure that only in genuine case of national security could such a measure be authorized, I think that would be a step um, in the right direction. And my last suggestion is that when the US tries to bring countries on board, obviously they have to be mindful of what they, uh, what they just said about the huge cost of uh, decoupling. And therefore it should articulate policy measures that are not just directed against China for China, uh, China uh, openly, but are targeting a specific uh, behavior or security risk. And I think that you would have greater buy-in from other countries who share concerns if you don't make it a China bashing exercise. Great, great. Um, yeah, my, uh, my EAI colleague, uh, Professor Bear, please. Uh, regarding technology, uh, the concept of national security has gradually expanded in many countries. For example, CFIUS, a committee on foreign investment in US had initially regulated only a limited scope of technology for national security, which was directly related to the production of military weapons in the early 1970s, but gradually expanded its regulation to include you know, all kinds of emerging and foundational infrastructure technology now. I think I, uh, it's desirable to restrict exports and investment only for you know, technology that have obvious national security implications. The problem is that it is difficult to determine and specify exactly which technology and product should be allowed for the you know, regulation from, from a national security perspective, because most of the technology take on the nature of civilian military dual use. Now, individual country decides what technology items to regulate. I think it seems to be necessary now to discuss the, the relationship between national security and trade investment uh, in a multilateral framework. Everybody is talking about uh, reviving CPTPP now. That might be a good starting point. And to make concerted effort to narrow down the regulatory area. I think the leadership role of the United States is important in this part. So I hope the Biden administration will play an important role in forming a multilateral norms on a uh, relationship of trade investment and national security. Thank you. Uh, one last comment. Okay, Samantha, please. Sure, thank you. I'd like to build a little bit on some things that Jeff said. I picked a slightly more optimistic topic than Jeff did, but, but, but every, I completely agree with everything he said. And I'd like to bring this idea of competition among economic and energy powers um, 
to bear on what we're doing with respect to climate change. We're seeing competition among, among us in all these areas, but we're seeing this going in both positive and negative directions. Um, from the positive point of view, um, China bringing manufacturing and innovation capacity to the clean energy world has done the world a lot of good. The cratering of prices for renewable energy that we've seen in the past years, a lot of that is due to Chinese manufacturing capacity. And so that's been undeniably good for the world and has brought greenhouse gas emissions down. But on the negative side, we're also seeing competition for various countries to help build infrastructure in the developing world, as Jeff said in his talk. I mean, the developing world is really the only place where we're seeing um, energy demand increase for the most part. Um, it's largely flat in the OECD. And so the kind of infrastructure that we build in these countries is incredibly important. And so some of the competition that we're seeing in that area is somewhat negative for the world and for greenhouse gas emissions. But this third area of competition, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. And that's this race of pledges that we're talking about. We're all talking about um, going towards net zero sometime in the mid century, the US, Europe, Korea, now China. Um, but the question is, are we gonna put policies behind those? It's very easy to come out and say, I wanna be net zero by 2050. It's far enough away that it sounds like something you can do. But this is a very lofty goal, particularly in difficult to decarbonize sectors. So I think the next area of great power cooperation slash competition is how we work together to operationalize these goals, to share technologies that we need to make this happen, to learn from each other about the kinds of policies that we put in place to make this happen. Because we'll need serious policy and we need it now to make these 2050 goals happen. It sounds far away, but it's not in terms of building and turning over infrastructure. And so I think that's the next area of this cooperation versus competition. And um, I certainly hope we go in a cooperative direction, but that remains to be seen because of the incredible um, economic growth that stands to come from the winners in this race in developing and commercializing some of these new technologies. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we are uh, um, actually, uh, uh, we are over time. So uh, I will have to conclude now. Um, thank you so much for, um, you know, a great panel. And also uh, thank you so much po for uh, the participants in, in, in the first uh, panel as well. Um, I mean, it's been uh, extremely useful uh, to figure out what, uh, are the challenges and obstacles and even opportunities lying ahead and some brilliant you know, policy ideas too. So um, I, I, I really uh, enjoyed um, you know, having this. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mireya, for uh, your collaboration. I think uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, time. Um, you know, working on, on this particular project and, you know, hope we uh, move on. And um, uh, all the papers uh, will be uh, revised and uploaded very soon on the EAI website. And I also will, will talk with uh, Miraya, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, Brookings uh, will, will do this. Uh, and, um, uh, Especially, i like to thank the audience from uh, um, East Asia, Korea. It's now, uh, you know, 1.30, 1.43 a.m. And uh, we really fight sleep. And, um, you know, uh, my, my, my colleagues are, are getting really, really weak. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for enduring uh, all the hardships. Um, so... Uh, I think uh, this is it, and, and, and um, uh, once again, I like to thank you for uh, you know participating in, in, in this seminar, and, and also Mireya. And uh, let me conclude. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.